your writing career, Har Tree. Well, it's so wonderful to meet you over Zoom and be able to interview you for Har Tree Magazine. I am the novelette. You are. <laughs> and Ruth and Jag is the Jaggy. 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 Uh -huh. Just oh. like it sounds, Jaggy, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So you write horror novels. I write dark speculative fiction and horror. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Cool. I actually just published an anthology called Sheer, a dark fantasy anthology. And uh -huh. It has dark uh, fantasy stories written from 16 authors in it. Short stories. I have had so much fun with that. It's so fun. Isn't it fun? That's yes. the number one thing that I always tell people. It's so much fun. Whether or not you're a fan of the horror genre, genre per se there's so many layers to it and there's so many directions you can go with like you say an anthology full of stories that you read things and you're like oh, I didn't even know that this could be something that could be written like this but then you go away and you've got that little shiver when you're walking through the house and, and you realize that something made an impact on you so I mean I just think that's terrific good for you awesome thank you and good for you too so I, I know that you have a new release coming out and would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, I do. Um, actually, I have a, a bunch of things going on. Um, cool. I've been writing professionally for two years so in January. Coming in January, it'll be two years. Um, and I've published 22 times with a bunch of fabulous indie publishers. Um, I've had the time of my life. I've also worked harder at this than I've ever worked at anything. But in January, I have my first solo novella coming out from DNT Publishing, and it's called The New Girl's Patient. Um, and I'm really excited about it because I think it's going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, as you know, you just uh, curated an anthology, and there's your classic tropes or your classic themes throughout that kind of thing. So I tend to write a little bit more of a folk horror kind of twist. I live on an old cattle ranch in a hundred year old farmhouse. So my surroundings and the history of the area and the fact that there's a lot of strange things that happen when you live in the country that when you live in the suburbs, you don't take note of, but because everything's so quiet out here, you tend to be a little more tuned in. Okay. So I try to employ a lot of those little twists and things in my story. Um, and it's, it's basically about a young woman who takes a position as a caregiver in a rural elderly hospital. And one of her patients expires, but she leaves her a gift and it's not quite on the surface. It, what it is on the surface isn't what it turns out to be. And when other people get involved in the situation, the whole history of the gift and why other people are eager to get their hands on it come into play. So um, it's a little bit of a oh, haunted house, a little bit of a horrific history, a little bit of folk horror kind of thing. Um, I'm very excited about it. I've been previewing covers with my publisher um, and we're going to get into the final editing process soon. But this past um, two months, I've had three short stories released, boom, boom, boom. So that's, as you well know, you know, there's a lot behind the scenes that goes on besides just writing the story. You've got to get into the editing. You've got to get into some PR. You've got to make sure it's formatted. So dealing with all of that has been, you know, it's been a lot of work, but gosh, it's the best, it's the best thing in the world. It's so much fun to be able to do. Like you said earlier, it's so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. And it's like when you have a passion for something, the work that goes behind it, it's like somehow you're inspired to do it, even if it's difficult, even if it's hard, even if there's a learning curve, because it's like, this is what you love. You're passionate about it. And it's like seeing it come to fruition is like such a fulfilling, satisfying feeling. Oh my gosh, I will never get tired of getting author copies. Um, because when you publish, typically you get um, an author copy, you know, your publisher sends you a copy, but then I usually order other ones to give away to my reviewers and different things like that. I will never get tired of tearing open the package and seeing a cover with my name on it. It's just like, 
oh my god is this really me and i go down to the house and my husband cracks up and he goes why would they give you a strip i know you know it's not your first rodeo he's pure texan um he goes, what is your first rodeo and i'm like yes but every time you somehow when you see your work in print it breathes life into your story yeah. it actually gives your characters a, a personality they become of course they're part of you when you write them in some small way you leave your little imprint in your characters when you write yeah. but when you actually hold a book that something you've written is included in it really does come alive it's it's a magical process does this sound silly but i think you understand what i'm saying oh i know exactly it, what you mean yeah i know exactly what you mean for sure it's just like seeing it's like it becomes it's this thing that you've imagined it's the thing you put so much work into but like holding it it's like it becomes tangible it becomes more real somehow well it almost becomes i don't want to use the word human but it takes on a, a life force to to you and then you flip through it and you read your story and of course we're all always our own worst critics but i've gotten better at that as time has gone on and i'm like damn i really like this character i tend to write a lot of strong interesting female protagonists um i have five sisters daughter granddaughter stepdaughter daughter-in-law i come from a very sororal world so a lot of my characters tend to be very strong um female characters whether or not they're good people is sometimes another story i think we all have that darkness and light um but because of the genre that i do write in some of my characters do tend to lean a little bit more towards the dark side um so when i flip through the pages and i actually see their name in print i'm like oh, she's real now she's real. Now she just came alive for me, you know, that kind of thing. So this yes. this kind of little a little bonus thing that you get every time you tear up in that Amazon or Ingram or wherever it's from book package and you're like, oh my god, here it is, it's real. Now it's starting to come alive. Yes. It's like yes, it's like it's real, it's here, it's manifested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Manifest. That's a very, very good word. Yes. Thank because you. When you're, when you're writing these things, and I'm sure you can connect to this, you tend to see it so much, especially in the editing process. I won't say you get sick of it, but it's a point where, oh my gosh, how many times, especially if you're working with an editor, how many times am I rewriting this paragraph? Or how many times am I looking at this line? And it kind of starts to blur a little bit and it loses some of its impact especially your characters because you're so immersed in it. So when you step away from it, and it's usually six, eight weeks after it's published that you get your author copy, well, then it's fresh again. And then it's exciting again in that respect. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, me, me as the host of this show and Horror Tree Magazine, we both definitely are loving having you on. And we definitely, uh, you're a perfect fit for this, for this oh, I love doing of affairs. It. So much, thank you so much for having me. I'm a fan of the horror tree, so I think everybody is in the genre. So. I do too. I am a fan too. Um, yeah, I like writing dark fiction characters myself. All of my characters are pretty much dark fiction. I very much gravitate to anti-heroes, and I love the idea that you have a lot of female protagonists, even if they're kind of... You know, and I, I, didn't, I didn't really plan it that way. Uh -huh. It's just when I started writing, um, you know, they always say write what you know, and, and I think that's a great rule of thumb, write what you know. For me, the story is in the misfits, the broken dolls, the damaged souls, the ones that may, it, whether they're affected because of actual trauma and reality or it's a perceived paranormal trauma or a psychological trauma, those are the characters that I tend to relate to more. So they're more interesting and I tend to write them better. Um, I won't say that we as as women, of course, you know, everybody says we're more emotional. I don't know if that's true because my husband's more emotional than I am. <laughs> but I think that we connect to those characters deeply because of our emotional state or what we've experienced, you know, as, as that kind of character ourselves in some things. So I do very much lean towards that. Now, I'm not, and there's always 
there's always men involved in my story. Of course, there's always men and other characters and, you know, whatever gender in my story. But I, I just tend to like the, the, the main character to have a quality, whether I see in myself or whether I notice in somebody else. Um, in one of your pre-questions to me, there was um, a little note about which character was most difficult for me to write. Yes. And it's really interesting because um, this is a book from DNT Publishing called It's All Fun and Games um, Until Somebody Dies. <laughs> this came out last year. It's a fantastic anthology. Everybody's into Squid Games. Squid Games uh -huh. is huge. Have you watched Squid Games? It's, it's, it's crazy fun. I haven't watched so, it yet. Heard a lot about it. Oh, yeah. Well, another, basically, it's just the games take over and the games are lethal. Well, this is the anthology that DNT Publishing put out last year. The character in my story, which is called The Contract, was so challenging for me to write because I really disliked her. <laughs> she represented everything I dislike in a female. And I tend to give females the benefit of the doubt. I will be the biggest cheerleader. Yeah. But she, I had to write, her name's Angie Wilcox, and she had to embody greed and bad decisions and never being satisfied with life and a layer of entitlement. As the story goes on, um, there's a game show and it's called The Contract and she is a guest on the game show. Well, basically she doesn't read the fine print and it doesn't go so well for her. But <laughs> to refer back to your question, she was so hard for me to write because I don't surround myself with people like that yet i knew for the context of the story she had to have some really horrible personality traits in order to pull the story off effectively yeah. um so i would say she was my anybody who's really really awful as a human being <laughs> it's truly hard for me to write it's easier for me to write like a like a demonic you know, yeah. entity than it is a woman yeah. who's got really some horrible personal characteristics and traits. That is very interesting and I kind of agree with that myself because when I write when I write even villains in my stories I always find a way I almost always need to find a way to have them feel justified in their in their way. Yes yes, yes. yes. you know and that's a really really good point um and another one of your questions you talk about some points that you might give um, amateur writers or people just breaking into writing. Yeah. It's a very strong point you just brought out, and I've had this discussion with other people. You have to be able to connect even to a villain. When yeah. you're crafting characters or designing characters, there has to be something about them. They can be the most despicable, yeah. horrible monster, yeah. but there has to be, like you said, a justification or a level of humanity, because yes. that's what hooks us and pulls us into the story. If we can't connect to that, well, maybe they were abused as a child. Maybe they had PTSD. Maybe their experiences, they had everything and they lost it. And now they're out for revenge. Yeah. But it's so important to stress that when you're writing um, a negative personality when you're writing a real villain as you say in a story you still have to have empathy for that villain yeah. why are you doing these things so that's a that's a really good point you just made i like that thank you so much yeah i feel like i if i if someone has like a dark personality in the story i do i feel like there needs to be a level of relatability even if it's like mm -hmm. something you would never do it's almost like what if you were in their shoes would you turn out like them maybe possibly yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, and especially since, you know, social media is such a, such a strong force in our day-to-day -day lives anymore, yeah. and I often wonder that, are people really representing themselves as they truly are? Are we seeing their true faces? Yeah. So you get into these villain things, and a lot of times, as we know, you can even get into serial killer conversations and that kind of thing. Some of the most normal people, some of the most charismatic people, people that are able to manipulate, control, do deviant deeds, that kind of thing, they're the ones that seem the most normal on the surface. Yeah. You know, they're 
person in the grocery store squeezing the tomatoes. Right. So, <laughs> and it's really funny because once you become immersed in this and once you, and this is a really good point that um, I did a mentorship with uh, Crystal Lake Publishing. And one of the things that one of my mentors told me was a couple of years ago was that Joe Menard, he's a, he's a brilliant publisher, great guy. He said, you will become this, what you do, you won't be able to separate it. In other words, you will always be seeing the story at a certain point. You will always be in the grocery store wondering if the guy squeezing the tomatoes, is he creepy? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Why is, he, why is he so focused on these tomatoes? Yeah. You know? <laughs> a little too much it's attention. So to it's after a while, because you do write this kind of fiction, you know, you get into the dark speculative world, you kind of look at the world a little, around you a little bit differently. So the, the point of people um, presenting themselves differently or the villains having a different face, we, we see that and you, you kind of look over your shoulder a little bit more. I mean, I laugh at it a lot, but... I'm like, oh yeah, right. You know, that kind of thing. Because I've probably already ran all these scenarios through my head. Yes, me too. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, go ahead, make your move, tomato guy. I've yes. got 13 ways I can take you down. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm already prepared right? for this. <laughs> right? But I, I, I mean, you just, you don't, and I remember Joe said this to me. He said, Should there'll come a point where everything is a story. Everybody is either a villain or somebody who could be a hero, you know, in a, in a situation. And you do tend to look at the world a little bit differently like that. Um, and that's, when you know, you've, you've absorbed what it means to be, to be able to write stories or to be a storyteller. So. I like that. I like that so much. And I feel like it's so true. I, uh, it's like we, as authors, we are able to kind of pull back the facade of the villains that we, we sleep with around every day. We just kind of fictionalize them and then kind of go into their different layers. And that's pretty fascinating. It is really yeah. fascinating. It is, it is fascinating. It's also, um, it can be unnerving sometimes. Yeah. You know, because I, I'm sure, and this is another point that I would bring up to a, a beginning writer, research is very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. Even if you, you don't use the details of your research so much. Um, I recently did a story for an urban anthology, uh, urban, urban legends anthology. And I chose the crosswords, the crossroads for my urban, my urban legend. Everybody knows the story of the crossroads. You know, Robert Johnson went down to the crossroads, got the guitar playing skills, made the deal with the devil, that kind of thing. Well, when I started researching the crossroads historically, I found out that there were a lot more to them and that in the Middle Ages, they involved hollow ground, the way the cities were constructed and there was a crossroad in the middle of town where executions were carried out, why did it didn't bury people and criminals in certain areas. Um, the church would be over here and the main part of town would be here. Um, to the point, I find that you, you start researching you may have a loose outline for your story. I had no intention of taking the story where I did, but because I did that really interesting research, it ended up there. It went into a whole really intriguing story about the crossroads and unhallowed ground and a young woman who had to make a very hard decision and what was she willing to sign away to survive her situation, as it were? So I think research, when you're crafting your villains, when you're, when you're getting into your initial part of the story, um, I'm not saying you have to have reams of notes. Yeah. But at least have something to refer back to. And that research tends to jog. You'll read one little thing and it'll be like, oh, wow, really? I yeah. can do that. I can <laughs> Yeah, this is a really cool little point in there type thing. So I would say anybody who is just starting out writing stories, do your research. Dig. Get into it. Go down a few rabbit holes. You know, figure out one little thing can make your story more interesting than maybe 10 other stories that are written on the same subject. So for me, research is real important too, but it's a time waster. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you get on there and you're Googling this and you're Googling that. And we joke about it. I'm in a couple of author groups and we're like, oh my God, if anybody ever saw our searches, 
because I know <laughs> you end up Googling things that I'm almost embarrassed when I'm typing. Yeah. Like I'm kind of <laughs> and I delete it afterwards because I'm like, if anybody ever saw what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. It's like FBI, don't pay attention to me. I'm just an author. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, like, you know, we're all a little paranoid at this point in life after the past yeah. couple of years. There was one story I did and it was a, it was a short but I had to um I need to research kind of what happened to the body after death and how that if somebody went into a morgue what condition what temperature it would need to be held at hold that the body would keep it fresh yes yes I was laughing so hard my <laughs> husband and I said um did you know that it whatever yeah. Fahrenheit degrees this happens to the human body and then it's fun fact <laughs> to me was the most terrifying <laughs> he goes babe you're scaring me <laughs> <laughs> just like just some, but, just some fun facts <laughs> yes. from my research <laughs> but for me it took this story into another level because it was a timing thing involved and there she had to get in and do what she was going to do to the body before it started to yeah. do a body after they're dead for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is a point that I would, I would emphasize with anybody who is looking to start writing, whether you write in the fiction genre or any other genre, spend some time. It's great to have the imagination, but one thing that I've learned, especially if you get into anything to do with witchcraft or rituals or anything where there's a genuine belief system or structure associated with it, mm -hmm. be dead on. Yeah. Because somebody will call you out. There will, I haven't had it happen because I'm pretty precise, but I have seen it so many times on Goodreads, Amazon, and the author groups. You need to know what you're writing about. You just can't get into, for example, hoodoo and say, oh, okay, well, you know, this is backwoods and this, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're going into a belief. You're going into a, a subculture based on history, um, do your homework mm -hmm. and then kind of outline your story and figure out how this may work into that. But so many times, especially when it comes to these, um, it, you know, lesser, well, they're not even so much lesser known, but um, less practiced or mm -hmm. less obvious things, you really have to spend your time and get your details right on that. So I would tell anybody, don't just put a story out there and think it's going to stick. Do your homework on the back end of it and get a few facts straight. I love that advice. I love that advice for sure. And it's very important, especially when doing something that, you know, is a belief system. It's almost like if we accidentally mess up something in it by not doing research, it's sort of like we, we don't respect the culture of it. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I find more and more that's really important to me. Because there's, there's so much, okay, I, I mentioned to you that I'm very rural, and there's a lot of even small, like, cemeteries, like, on people's properties and things, and you need to know why this happened and why they buried people this way. Mm -hmm. Was it during the Depression? Did they not have resources? Was there something socioeconomical going on? Was there a belief system in place? That kind of thing. Um, so I think that's a real important point that I personally would make to a fresh writer is to, or somebody that was aspiring to write, don't just throw random things out there and think for the uh, shock factor or the, to carry the story forward that this is going to be effective. You need to know what not to say when you're writing these things. Yeah. You need to point out that if you're going to bring up, you know, Southern Gothic, is such yeah. a huge, and it's one of my personal favorites, right? But if you're going to get into all these beliefs of New Orleans and Louisiana yeah. and what happens down in the um, rural swamp areas, you'd best do a little talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, uh -huh. it's very powerful, A, but you also want it to represent in your story as something you as an author are appreciative and know enough about to respect it, as you say. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff being thrown out there 
randomly currently, and I find I cringe a little bit at it. So it is. research is real important. Before I even start writing, I kind of, you know, make, a, make notes of what I need to spend some time looking at. I think that's wonderful. And I think that that's an, an important step when talking about anything that has to have any uh, historical significance. Mm -hmm. or pull mm -hmm. anything historical. I just did an assignment in class. I, uh, I'm getting my master's in media and arts. And oh, I'm awesome. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. I just did an assignment recently, a presentation on J.R.R. Tolkien and his uh -huh. the way that he used ancient literature to pretty much build the backstory, the back, the culture of the Lord of the Rings. And right. it's like, he did an immense amount of research. He even created four different languages based on his research for the Lord of the Rings. It's like that is what we all that's the commitment to uh, respecting culture and developing right. our, our world building abilities. Uh, the best. I think that that's how how deeply you have to be committed to be to doing research for I, I agree. and it also by proxy he created a masterpiece yes. he created you know he made, he made a huge mark on the literary world um and i would say to to some extent not as much even even our modern fantasies like um you know game of thrones and that type of thing yes. anything you're getting anytime you're getting into this but I think for me, because, um, like I say, I really like what I call backyard horror or folk horror, which is usually based in superstition. It's based on hearsay. Mm -hmm. It's based on history. Yeah. Anytime you get into that also, you have to do the, do the same thing in a smaller scale, because a lot of times there were languages involved. There were superstitions involved. You know, there were stories that were passed down through generations um and you want to get those points right whether you're crafting an expansive world like Tolkien did, Tolkien did or you're just writing about a boogeyman coming out from the cornfield out and back <laughs> yeah backstory and how he may have been created is just as important if you're basing it on superstition history facts um and it's so much fun yeah you have to, you have to, you have to be passionate about this, not just as an author, but as a reader. Yeah, you exactly. You want to just read this stuff. It's just, there's so much good stuff. There is. It is. It's a wealth of information and learning about it. It's entertaining and it's also informative too. And it's like, it just becomes, it becomes this whole, the, a whole passion in and of itself. The whole yes. genre. Yeah. I, I, I have often said that if I had to do it again, um, I would be the girl immersed in the in the library with those big rolling um, ladders that go around. Oh. I'd be like Laura Croft yeah. doing the yeah. doing the homework on esoteric <laughs> Egyptian languages. Yes, <laughs> because I really do love it, and yeah. it's real interesting. Um, I've traveled extensively. I've been very very fortunate. Um, when you do get outside the United States and you start dealing with different cultures and different beliefs and that type of thing, it's amazing how much of a crossover there is with certain things. They may call them by different names, but there's so many different dark and light entities, whether it's connected to an organized religion or not, mm -hmm. that you find all over the world. I know right now that uh, Cassandra Cause got a, a, a book out that's mind blowing, um, Nothing But Black and Teeth. It's been all over every place. It's just real interesting. Well, her mythology is based on a Japanese ghost, ghost story. And she gets into the, the ghosts and the history and where these different entities come from. Um, so when you start traveling, you may say, oh, yeah, you know, I was in China and they had this big, but, you know, now I'm in Greece and they're, they've got a water entity that's very similar to this one here. So that's another part of it that's really, really fascinating is there is this global and whether it's paranormal or not. Yeah. All of these things that we as authors and readers in the dark fiction genre mm -hmm. um, experience, there's something that triggered it. There's something real out there. I do I, that. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, vampires are real and ghosts are real and all this, <laughs> but there's a belief system. There's something 
the grandmother told the kids so that they went to bed at nine o'clock. There's something there. Yeah. There's a warning. There's a cautionary tale there. Yeah. And that to me is what's so cool when you get into this, whether you're crafting big, expansive fantasy worlds or like me, I look out at four cornfields in a vineyard. You're writing about some creature that you think you see crawling around there at night. Yeah. It's really a raccoon half the time. <laughs> but you know, I'm like, why? Oh, there's something outside. You go look at it. He's like, it's a raccoon. I'm like, no, no, no. There are these pointy eyes and they were red. <laughs> look, it's a beast. I'm telling you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So in my mind, yeah. You know, and that's going to end up in a story somewhere. Um, but it really is a, a kind of a universal thing that um, these worlds we create or these threats or these, these visceral fears that yeah. get us to read and write in yeah. this genre. It's all based on some, some little niblet somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. There's a problem somewhere that we're taking out of something and we're building upon it. Um, yeah. That's well that is awesome that's so much fun to be able to do it, it is cool it's like throughout cultures in the world even ancient cultures who had no communication with each other from one side of the globe <laughs> they had like you said similar theories about like the water or any other or, or supernatural forces um, that is incredible to me it's like there's a shared revelation between humanity i i absolutely agree with that and that's why again i'll go back to it's so important if you're going to write about these things, even if it's a, a mermaid, yeah. where did this, where did this, where did this mythology come about? You know, so much of it, if you have, you know, any kind of a classical education, when I was Catholic schooled, which is probably why the way I am the way I am now, that's <laughs> excuse to my mom, but there's so much that's steeped in mythology and there's so much that's steeped in um, histories of peoples and cultures and, I'm seeing more and more of it in the genre, and I absolutely love it. Yeah. Everything's starting to get thrown into the pot, and no longer is it separated by haunted house, witch, zombie, you know, that type of thing. We're coming up with all these fears and these fascinating things to write about that are actually part of our day-to-day -day life, whether we heard them when we were five years old or we experience them through travel or social media or whatever. Um, I just think it's a really exciting time to be writing in the platform and writing in the genre because um, pretty much anything goes. Yeah. As long as you stay in your lane and like you brought out, you're respectful of the culture. Mm -hmm. I am reading some of the most fascinating stories. Um, I've currently got uh, Ellen Datlow, who's, She's the ultimate editor for horror. Ooh. She's got um, the, the year's best horror just came out, but I'm reading Body Shocks. And it's a lot of, um, it's short stories written by some of the most incredible authors I've read, ever read in my life, but everything's to do with what we've referred to as body horror. Things that happen to the body, illnesses, um, manifestations, yeah. <laughs> um, altering of the body. Um, I did a story last year about that. I mean, I, we're, we're also, you know, we're also exposed to all of this all of the time. I'm telling you what, I am reading things in this book. It's called Body Shocks. I, I've never read stories like is included in this volume. Wow. It is fascinating. People <laughs> are really starting to expand and explore and, even getting into alien relationships that are just uh -huh. horrifically mind blowing when it comes to like potentially how would an alien alter our bodies to suit their culture and you know oh, that wow. kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just, it's really fun. I and mean, we could talk about this for five years. There's so much interesting um, life going on around us now that we're, we can pull from for so many of these stories that we're writing. And what's really cool is that all of us are kind of exposed to these different stories, but with authors, it's like in each, in each and every person, they can use the same information and come up with a totally different tale. And I find oh that so God. intriguing. It's like, it our, is. yeah, each it and every individual imagination. And that is just so cool. can come up with these things. I think that's well, just generally when, when the publishers I've published with, um, there's a theme, but I'm, I've been very fortunate. Now I'm being invited to join in anthologies. I don't have to sub as much. Um, 
there's generally a theme, but they pretty much let you run with it. They're like, okay, this is what we'd like within the parameters of what we want the anthology to look like or what we want the collection to look like. But they're pretty much leaving it up to us anymore. Um, yeah. There may be some editing at the end if they really feel something doesn't fit the flavor of the book as they want to publish it and put it out there. Um, but I, I don't know. You know, I've only been doing this two years, but even in that two years, I'm seeing where the, the writing universe has just, the floodgates have opened. Yes. You know, more people started writing during COVID because people had, well, when COVID was actually like, new to us and everybody was trying to figure out were they going to stay employed were they going to take time off were they going to do different things more people started writing um and it doesn't mean there was better writing but more people started writing and yeah. i think in that respect um it brought what the publishers it gave them more to go on because they realized there were voices out there that may have never written a story before, but you know, the kind of people like me just said, what the heck, I've always wanted to write, I'm gonna start writing. Yeah. And I do it as a passionate, um, dedicated hobby. I would tell anybody who is getting into writing, like for the first time, yeah. don't quit your day job because <laughs> it's a hit process. <laughs> You're probably not really going to get, you know, there's very few Harry Potters out there, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're probably not going able to retire well off it. You will have an incredible community of people, which is, the, to me, the very best part of the process is the people that are involved in the community. Oh. A lot of like-minded souls that are just very generous Um you know, and I know some people say, oh, yeah, well, it's hard for this and it's hard for that. I can honestly say I have only met wonderful people and had wonderful experiences. I think you tend to get back what you put out. Um, and if you try to use your own voice when you're writing, that's something else I would suggest to somebody starting out. Use your own voice. Read what other people are writing, but... I actually saw a few times where people who were starting to write initially were taking stories that had been out there and there's nothing wrong with it and reframing them and doing something different with on a similar vein. Yeah. I would say that's great. And there are a lot of retellings out there. I love retold fairy tales, for example, but use your own voice, put into it something that puts your stamp on it. So when they read your work, they're going to say, Oh yeah, that's Ruth stuff. I know she likes these strong female characters that commit atrocities. You know that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> these, so, these themes, it's like it, 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 it's kind of our stamp, our little bit of a stamp. Like this is this was what Ruth Ann would write. This is what Ivana would write. This is what. Well, and author. if you're fortunate, if you're really fortunate, people start to realize that because you're writing, it won't be similar, but they'll see that you do present things in a certain way. I think it's really important. Um, one of your one of your brilliant questions, and I really loved your questions because they were different. Was Thank how you. do you craft a story that hooks people? Um, get into the story right from the get go. Cool. In other words, for me, in my first paragraph, my first sentence, I try to introduce either my villain or my hero or I try to make it crystal clear what the threat or the result of the threat will be. Yes. In other words, to hook somebody, you got to get them to read past three paragraphs. Better. You don't want to end up in the do not finish. Yeah. And the other thing I try to do, and you know, I, I really, I'm really loving Gothic literature as they, they, there's so many layers to that also. But Gothic traditionally makes the setting a character as well. It's very immersive. It's very atmospheric. So I will try right off the get-go to set the tone of where this story is being told. Um, where is it? Why is it happening? Um, it's real, real important if you're going to hook a reader into a story, get to the meat of the story. 
Don't start telling a lot of backstory. Don't start telling a lot of history. I have a habit, and it's kind of a good, bad thing sometimes. I put my character right out there, and then I go back and I tell you some of the things that kind of may have gotten them to the point where they made these decisions. Um, I've got a story coming out in a really cool anthology releasing next month called Baker's Dozen with some phenomenal authors. And everything had to have a bakery theme or a baking theme. Um, and my character, and her name's cool. Laura Rola, uh, she's kind of an unfortunate character. All she really wants is love, but she kind of goes about it the wrong way. <laughs> it involves a pie eating contest. So when you meet Flora at the beginning of a story, Flora's days on this earth are basically coming to an end because of something she did in the story that set off a chain chain reaction. Yeah. So if you want to hook a reader and you're a fresh writer or a new writer, get them right from the beginning. Tell them what's happening. Um, and, you know, we can get into the show versus tell. Yes, you show them what's happening, but tell the story right from the beginning. Don't wait until you're six pages in. Don't <laughs> talk about, you know, John Smith going down the, you know, yeah. Highway to hell kind of thing on his way to Vegas. Yeah. You want to smell John Smith. You want to feel John Smith. You want to share Cheetos with John Smith. Get right into the front seat with John Smith while he's going right down that highway to hell. Mm -hmm. So me, that's something personally that I test myself to do every single time I write a story is to write from the beginning, get right into it. Mm -hmm. If it's messy, well, then we'll kind of clean it up after the fact, but yeah. It's worked well for me because people like reading. Uh, they go on and they'll read my story. There's so much out there to read that you got to give people a reason to stick with you. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to toss it or turn the page. And I know we're all guilty of that. So. <laughs> yeah. It's like we're always competing. We're competing for attention. It's like there's so many books, like you said, out there. It's like if one oh my God. chapter... Oh. There's always yeah. another. And then they're going to like DN out their book. But I love how you said in the beginning, you show what the threat is. And that's like opening the pages and the stakes are already raised. It's like, I'm already. Well, this, yeah. You know, I'm already on pressure. Uh -huh. In this genre, you know, they, they often say you want the horror to be immediate. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean it has to be an in your face horror. That doesn't mean you know, the vampire's pounding at the window, even though he may be. Uh -huh. You want to show that there's a, an uncomfortable feeling. Yeah. You want to set the vibe that mm, something's not quite right with this right from the beginning, because then your reader is going to hopefully be intrigued enough to find out what's going on, and they want, they want you to tell them the story of what's going on. Yeah. So that's something I've kind of learned by trial and error. When I first started writing, I used to give more backstory on my people. Now I don't. Now I tell you what's happening to my people. And then I tell you kind of what, why they're in the position they're in. But I think that threat or that immediate, just the discomfort. And it doesn't, you know, to me, some of the best horror isn't always the most obvious. Right. It's that what is that tapping out there? What is that yeah. the field doing? Is he digging? Why does he keep digging in the same spot? Yeah. Is there a body buried there? You know, that kind of. Yeah. So that's why I like to try to bring in your immediate feel of discomfort right from the beginning. And I think in that respect, back to your question, that for me is what helps hook a reader is you're creating a story that's making them want to read the story as opposed to getting into a story and trying to find out what the threat is. Yeah. Bring the threat, bring it to the forefront a little bit sooner. And then what you end up with the climax may not even be that same threat. What's a perceived threat may not actually be the real threat. Yeah. Um, to me, that's, that's super important. I'll, I'll bring up a book here because it's, it's been talked about so much this year. Stolen Tongues, written by Felix Blackwell. Oh, it I is, think about oh my God. Better. I can honestly say this book scared me more than any book I've read in five years. Really? And it's, it starts out, and I'm not going to give anything away, but everybody kind of knows it. 
you need to read this book. If this book isn't made into a major motion picture, I will be flabbergasted. And <laughs> Felix Blackwell is the greatest guy in the world. Um, but it starts out with a conversation a man is having with a parrot. Wow. And it unnerved me so bad Ooh. that every night, like I say, I live in an old farmhouse. You know, you get up at two o'clock in the morning and you go pee. Ooh. I'm looking out the window to see if there's a parrot in the window. Literally, literally, I lost sleep over this opening sequence for about two weeks because the way he crafted the dialogue and what went back and forth with this man and this bird was so uncomfortably threatening. Wow. It, it, you've got to <laughs> read tongues. Everybody's been talking about stolen tongues. Stolen it, tongues. It's, it's, it, yes, it's just a masterful little, it's not a small book, it's a novel. Yeah. But the way he brings this, like you're sitting there going, what the heck? <laughs> and I tell you, I've discussed it with, you know, in the groups with a lot of different people. So many people had that unsettled feeling right from the beginning. Cool. And people were like, I had to put the book down for two hours. I could, I had to put the book down for a week. I can't remember the last time I had to do that. It cool. literally, it is for me, it was one of the scariest books I've ever written, but it definitely was one of the most uncomfortable books I've written in the past, I've read in the past few years. So Stolen Tongues does a masterful job of getting into that, like, what is going on? Yeah. Right? By page three, you are shaking. You're like, <laughs> you burn your head at night. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to read that. I'm going to have to find that. <laughs> you tell me what you thought after you read it because I will. Literally, literally it's just very talked about. It's very, very different. But the opening to this book is, is really something. <laughs> I would love to read that. And we're yeah. all going to have to read that. All the viewers of this interview are going to have to read that. Stolen, so stolen tongues. And, and it's one of those things where, you know, like I say, it's not the, you're not walking into the room and there's a body bleeding on the floor. There's not yeah. a vampire in the window. It's dialogue between a man and a parrot. It's eerily, it's eerily scary. Oh, oh, yeah. it's just so unnerving. You feel your, your, your nerves start to fray when you're reading it. <laughs> I love that. I down. I'm like, I can't walk away from this. <laughs> you know, like, this is really scaring me because there's um, heinous, uncomfortable Im implications in the conversation. Yeah. And you're just like, oh my God, where's this going to go? <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow. So to me, that's a really, really fine example of um, getting right into your immediate threat when you get, when you get into writing your story. I love that. I love that so much. Ruth Ann, Jackie, Jackie. Oh yes. My gosh, this has been one of the best interviews I think I've ever had. Oh, I, love I love talking to you. We could talk all night. We've got I know. I feel like we could. I hope you'll ask me again. It's, it's, it's been an absolute joy talking to you. I love meeting you. Thank you so you much. Too. It has been a joy talking to you. And we definitely appreciate having you on here for Hard Tree Magazine. And tell us, the viewers, where we can find out more about you and your upcoming releases, please. Um, you can find me on my website, which does need a little updating like everybody's. We're too busy writing, but it's www.withanjeggy.com. <laughs> I've got an Amazon author page. I'm Redhead Writes, R I T E S, on um, Twitter, Instagram, Ruth Ann Jaggi, author, um, Facebook, all the usual suspects, all the usual places. Um, my website does link back to everything and every place. I will try to update it. You know, that's such, it's so time consuming. Yeah. And that's not what you want to be doing. I want to be writing a chapter. Right. Um, I, I've been Yes, I just kind of keep it updated. But my <laughs> author page, um, you can also find me on Amazon, um, pretty much all over the place. Um, I'm, I'm out there. I hope to be out there for a long time to come. And once again, thank you so much for having me. I love meeting you. Oh, um, you. Love you studies, and I'm sure we'll chat again along the way. And get back to me on Stolen Tongues and some of these other things. I will. I will be definitely reading Stolen Tongues. Hopefully I can get a review copy, but if not, I'll just go ahead and buy it. <laughs> Because uh, it sounds really good. So I'm excited it really to read good. it. It's really good. It's a, it's, a, it's a book to study as to how, 
certain techniques really work in a story. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so, so fun. Much. And we will talk again for sure. I would love that. Happy holidays to you. Take care. Happy holidays.